because I had to use. Okay, I, I had to use my laptop and the agendas on my laptop. So I'm, got, I'm winging it from memory here. Um, any news or information, John, from the Harbor Commission? Well, we had that conference call that all I could do was listen. Uh, I was hoping Jeff would give a report on it, but he's stuck on a train and he's gonna he's gonna join us as soon as he can, as humanly possible. Um, but you know it's in a process right now, so that process is gonna take uh, another meeting or two to, to uh, delve into what the questions and the re and the requests are. Uh, it's ourselves with 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 shellfish. Uh, look, look, looking to, to push for a public hearing and also uh, a group hired an attorney uh, regarding their use of Manresa and it's Village Creek and Harbor View and uh, Wilson Point and uh, several other larger groups that have hired an attorney and it, it's in a process right now. So the, the next meeting is uh, within a, a week or 10 days to start delving into what some of the issues are. We have to submit information, but I'm, I'm hoping that during the course of this meeting that, and especially that we, we possibly can go a little longer with shellfish not meeting tonight, need be, that Jeff can weigh in and give you more of the details on it. And, and, or, and, and Pinto, because Pinto was on the call and Pinto actually spoke on both our behalves shellfish and, uh, and harbor. Excuse me, um, John, you said that shellfish was not meeting tonight? No, uh, there, there's a few people on the commission that have COVID and Steve, oh, is, wow. and Steve wow. is stuck in New Jersey. Oh yeah, thank you. Okay, a little bit more on, on what John was talking about. One of the major concerns with the um, the draft on the permit uh, that DEEP will give the DOT to start work is that there is nothing on water quality. And, and we will talk about this later on in the meeting. That, that'll be the second half of the meeting. Yeah, I mean, because well, everything that we negotiated over the last couple of years with, with input from consultants, ourselves, and uh, experts like Joe, knowing uh, quite a bit about turbidity and, and, and Dick, we, we came up with a plan and a program, uh, a protocol, so to speak, and, and none of that is included in their deep uh, submission. So it's like, why do we waste all these countless hours and having meeting after meeting after meeting with uh, 20 people from the state showing up for every one of those meetings and them agreeing to a course of action. The thing that's very dis disheartening, alarming, and it doesn't sit right with me. And we're going to start making some inquiries about that. Why the city of Norwalk didn't have one of their attorneys and have an interest in what's going on or not happening. Uh, the state of Connecticut had an assistant attorney general. DOT had three lawyers on the phone. DEEP had two lawyers on the phone. The lawyers from the Manresa group. And yet the city of Norwalk, besides us people, are not being represented and our interests looked after. And there's nothing that we're looking to have done or requiring or what we've spoken about with at length with DOT and agreed to that's uh, harmful. It's all to the betterment of our waters and our shellfish industry and our citizenry at the end of the day. So why why aren't the, the, the law department in all weighing in on this? So we'll, we'll, John, we'll talk more about that after okay. Brittany's, okay. Um, next one, Chris, anything on your end from deep? Uh, 
Not a lot. I, I did get a question from somebody on the Council on Environmental Quality about the um, hydrilla eradication that was done up on Parting Brook, which is a tributary to the Silver Mine River. And uh, I sent it to three towns, Wilton, Norwalk, and uh, New Canaan. And I only got a report from Wilton, and it wasn't very thorough. So I just wonder if anybody has any information as to whether hydrilla has in fact spread down into the silver mine and beyond um, below Parting Brook. I mean, I, not, haven't heard, I haven't heard anything yeah. about that, Chris. What, what Was there an eradication done? Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. There was a, a pond up on Parting Brook, I believe, where somebody stocked some fish and along with the fish probably came some turions of hydrilla. And it was identified in that pond and a little bit further downstream. And I know they did some eradication, I think, with sonar pellets. And that was years ago, though. So oh, just that was, was wondering if there were any um, progress reports. Of CEQ was inquiring about the success of various hydrilla management practices in the state. So that's that's why I, why I asked. So. Um, yeah, other than is, that, is there is an art. Is it, sorry, is it something that we should go look for to, you know, to figure out the answer to that? Like, is there hydrilla? And well, I, I don't think it's urgent to get that answer, but uh, it would be interesting for, I think it was Peter Hearn from the CEQ who was asking that question. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not urgent. You don't have to run out there and with your boots and Go looking for it, especially now with the cold water, it might be dying back. I, I, I feel like Harbor Watch. Well, I have to look at the map, but I wonder if they yeah, ask. They might know. Anyway, okay, good to know. I should have sent that to, to um, Sarah. I didn't. Um, okay, the other thing is there is a Norwalk River Watershed Initiative quarterly meeting. It's scheduled for Wednesday the 12th at 3 p.m. And I am aware that they've made a lot of progress with developing the job description for the um, coordinator's position, which hopefully will be advertised soon after this meeting. But I, I can't speak for Southwest Conservation just on the date of that, but, but they've made progress. So, and there is some funding left over. Excellent. Dick, Yo. how are your mitten crabs? Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. We've uh, launched a three-pronged attack up there. We put placed four traps uh, baited with chicken parts. We visited them three times now over the month of December, and there were no crabs. There was nothing, no, no blue crabs either. And that uh, comes after the summer where we ran one trap and caught endless supply of blue crabs. Now, one mitten crab has turned up in a dredge in early December. And then the dredging stopped because all the shellfish people were moved down to Norwalk to pick up on the business there. And the dredging that has just commenced on this Monday. So that seems to be the catch all for getting these damn things. And the other thing is we, we, we used our beam trawl up there seven times. The whole net thrust of that was we caught something like 50 small shrimp, shore shrimp and, and grass shrimp. But in the mix was a, Rockpool shrimp, which is another invader. So I called Dr. Carlton, who's the big pro, who was telling me about that, and he just went nuts. He just thought that was unbelievable. That's the farthest south they've seen this thing. It's an invader from Europe. And uh, so I have an aquarium, and uh, we're going to go back and do some more dredging, uh, trawling, and see what we come up with. The odd thing was, that's all that was on the bottom was small shrimp and one skillet fish. There were no other fish that we caught in the trawl. But there's been a big invasion of stripers up there. Uh, huge numbers have come in. And during the summer, we saw up to 200 cormorants sitting along both sides of the harbor. So I think there's been some action against the bottom fish. It's, it's amazing that every time you've reported, you've also talked about skillet fish. And, yep. and these were not common 10 years ago. Right. <laughs> so it, it's, um, for those of you that don't know what a skillet fish is, it's, it's, maybe an inch or two in size at the most. And they have, a, they have a unique ability to attach themselves to things. And um, they're great to watch in an aquarium. 
because they can really blend into whatever is on the bottom. And it's, it's, it's just an interesting little fish that, you know, in all the years of, of doing this stuff, I never saw one until one day one appeared at the aquarium and that was it. And that was probably 10, 15 years ago. I've so. got two of them in an aquarium and also the uh, rock pool shrimp. They're, they're all still alive. Excellent, excellent. It, these shrimp, oh. that, these little shrimp that you're talking about, did it grow up to be big shrimp? And it, nope, if so, that's I, it. Okay, <laughs> so they're not a mark. It's not nice. a marketable product. That we nice. No market there. The only market nice is try, for stripers. Yeah. We eat them up. They only nice have to be inch and a half. I, I, I was just wonder if we're going to wind up with porous gum coming up in our harbor. <laughs> No one can tell me why rock pool shrimp are, are a threat. All they say is that when they move into an area, they take over. So that's all I know. <clears throat> and what eats them? Striped bass. bass. Bass, right away. So we could maybe attract a lot more bass in the area. Possibly. Well, there's an awful lot of bass that showed up. The blooms caught 70 bass in three hours. Wow. That's unbelievable. And there are other boats have with the same measure of luck going on nearby. Okay, we don't have anybody with shellfish here tonight. So hopefully um, Steve thought he might be able to make it, uh, but we'll see if he, he can make it towards the end. And uh, Bill, you're finished with dye testing, correct? That's correct at the Wilson Point, yes. Okay. And has there been anything on the drain pipes coming in from the north? No, uh, we haven't really been doing much testing of late. I'm meeting with, uh, with Dick and uh, Sarah Crosby and Ralph Kolb next week to discuss kind of what, how we're gonna go about this uh, testing and what we, what, what we can do about trying to um, find out some of the sources of where some of these metals are coming from. And that type of thing, as well as uh, any of the wherever the high counts for the bacteria are coming from, try and locate and isolate some of those. So we're going to be discussing that next week and seeing how we're going to uh, plan going forward to uh, see what we can do about those. Okay, excellent. Uh, if you can keep us in the loop on how that that unfolds, we'd appreciate it. Sure. Yep. Okay, and uh, Brittany, you're here. Yes, I am. Hello, okay. everyone. <laughs> this is Brittany is Vicky. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes, and that is right. She is with USGS and has been surveying the Norwalk River for how many months now? Or is it a year? We started in May of 21. Okay. So take it away. They're all yours. Okay, okay great. I will share my screen. Coast Guard is one of my uh, are, is one of my favorite people. Sir, thank, <laughs> thank you for your service. My grandson just graduated in May as an officer, and uh, he was in Sitka, Alaska, and, and Florida, and Maryland, and now he's in Seattle he, he, from helicopters. Oh wow! Rescue. That's what he's been doing for the last ten years. Now he's into logistics, I guess, in Seattle uh, with all the ships that are out there. Oh, that's great. That, that's wonderful. Good for him. That's wonderful. Well, it's a pleasure to meet everyone. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to explain. And of course, my dog just grabbed a squeaky toy. So I hope you can't hear it on your end. <laughs> I'll, I'll just ignore it. But um, I appreciate the opportunity to showcase the work that USGS has been doing uh, in the Norwalk embayment. We started this project in May of 2021, and we're going to continue for two more years monitoring the embayment, uh, the Norwalk embayment. So I, the presentation is mostly going to focus on those efforts, but I also wanted to take a moment to showcase the long-standing work that USGS has been doing in the Norwalk watershed. I figured this would be a really good opportunity to showcase the historical sites that we've been collecting data at since the early 1960s. And so we have the Norwalk River at South Wilton, 
that has been collecting stage and discharge since 1962. And then we have the Norwalk River at Winnipeg that is a long-term discrete water quality station since 1980. And in the 1990s, it became part of a national water quality assessment study in USGS. And so we do intensive sampling at that site. We sample for nutrients, metals, major ions, herbicides, pesticides, uh, bacteria indicators. And then we also do biological community assessment as well benthic algae, invertebrate, and fish communities too. And our most recent intensive uh, study was in 2016. It was part of our Northeast Stream Equality Assessment, um, where we looked at multiple stressors in various urban and reference watersheds. And so we have done a lot of work um, in those, and please feel free to uh, interrupt me at any point, and I'm more than happy to stop and expand more. And so those were the two sites that we've been collecting data at previously. And so starting in May of 21, we have moved down into the embayments as part of a larger study. And we have these unique USGS IDs uh, with our site IDs. And so we are moving from our basic eight digit site IDs for our freshwater streams to uh, 15 digit site IDs, sites that are impacted by salt wedges and stuff. And so the focus of this presentation is going to be on the embayment, but just to provide that additional information to everyone, I'm more than happy to expand more after this presentation on any previous data collection that we've been doing. So the embayment monitoring that's been going on, um, the state of Connecticut is continues its second generation nitrogen strategy. It's working on a comprehensive approach to manage impacts to the Long Island Sound and coastal embayments. And so eight embayments were prioritized. Out of the eight, USGS uh, is gonna work with Connecticut Deep to model four of the priority embayments. And so we started with the Norwalk River and the Mystic River this year in May of 21. And that's going to continue for two years. And then starting in the spring of 2022 this year, we're actually going to be working on the Saugatuck River and then the Sasco Southport complex. And we'll be monitoring those two abatements for two years as well. And so the, it's a three-year study. Um, and we're hoping that this will support the development of nutrient models for each embayment. And we'd like to build off of our existing long-term ambient water quality monitoring network that is currently being operated by USGS and Connecticut Deep. And so we're hoping that this will develop a series of models from these priority embayments that will improve the understanding of the physical, the chemical processes, uh, and ultimately understand um, and manage impacts to the Long Island Sound. So that's what we're hoping our data collection efforts will do. And the Norwalk embayment, we are going to be collecting data at three sites. We've identified three sites. They were selected by USGS, Connecticut Deep, and a model advisory group. And we really wanted to look at spatially uh, coverage from other data collection efforts. So the Unified Water Study, we knew that they were doing a really big uh, data collection. And so we looked at their coverage and saw that they had really great coverage. Uh, I think there was about six locations in the lower embayment and then um, probably about six more sites going up to Wall Street. So we didn't want to duplicate the efforts, but try to find a way to complement uh, the previous data collection efforts. So we've selected these three sites uh, up near Ferry Point, the Norwalk, the Maritime Aquarium, and then the Norwalk Cove Marina. And those are our three sites that we're going to be focusing on. And those are going to be collected from May of 2021 all through April of 2023. So the water quality monitoring that we're doing, we're collecting discrete water quality data. And we are collecting discrete samples uh, 
we we're doing it bi-monthly from May to October of 21 and monthly from November to April of 23. So it's going to be year round sampling and we did uh, intense sampling in the summer. And so we've been collecting top and bottom samples at the three locations at the Ferry Point Maritime Aquarium and the Cove Marina. And so we're collecting near surface about a foot below the water surface and near bottom, which is about a foot and a half from the bottom. All of the samples are collected on the same day and they're collected during various tidal cycles to capture the different conditions that we can see in the embayments. So this table right here lists all the parameters that we're analyzing for our discrete water quality data. So we have, uh, we sample for nutrients, we do have um, phosphorus, we are collecting silica as well, alkalinity, and then we have total suspended solids, carbonaceous biological oxygen demand, and chlorophyll samples as well. And we're able to calculate total nitrogen and organic nitrogen with the parameters that are being analyzed. So in conjunction with our discrete water quality samples, uh, each sample is accompanied by a vertical profile. So we are collecting water temperature, specific conductance, uh, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, and pH. And then in addition, we're looking at light attenuation. So we're measuring uh, photosynthetic active radiation. We have a PAR sensor that we're measuring in the water and then accompanied by a PAR and air sensor to really help us look at the light attenuation as well. So for our continuous water quality data collection at the three locations that I mentioned, we are collecting continuous water quality data. So the Norwalk River at Ferry Point, that site is uh, collecting water temperature and specific conductance. And we have a monitor, it is actually at the um, Maritime Rowing Club. We have that hanging off of a dock near surface. It's logging internally. We go there every two or three weeks to download the data and we put that up on our um, endless web available to the public. The Maritime Aquarium and the Cove Marina, those are our super stations. We have our top and bottom monitors. Uh, top is about three feet below the surface and our bottom monitor is about one foot above. So this really allows us to look at the stratification that we see in the Norwalk River. And with these sites for our continuous water quality, we're collecting water temperature, specific conductance, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, and chlorophyll. And we're also doing underwater PAR in the lower embayment and then we're looking at PAR and air at the aquarium as well. And these, this data is collected on six minute intervals. Um, so we're really, we have a lot, we have a robust uh, sample effort here with the data collection. And we are computing um, dissolved oxygen percent saturation and salinity using the parameters that we're collecting as well. And so, this was probably the most fouled monitor I've ever seen in, in my life. It looked like something out of Davy Jones's <laughs> closet when we pulled it up out of the Cove Marina. And that just showed us that we need to come here more often and assess the fouling. But I will say, um, you know, it, these are beautiful sites, especially the Cove Marina. Everyone has been very accommodating and working with us on the Norwalk River, which has been great, especially when it came to the permissions and the installs as well. Brittany, how, how many, um, what period of time was that in the water bef before you pulled it to clean off the fouling? This, okay, so this was the first time that we had it in the water. And I would say it was probably about four weeks, which is much longer than we wanted to go. Okay. So it was initially installed and we weren't able to get back out there until another four weeks. Then when we saw that we were like, okay, we're coming every two weeks. And it's been uh, more manageable since then. Okay. And just right here are uh, pictures of our continuous water quality monitoring sites. We have, I have the links to the NWIS data page for each one. Uh, the 
I, I'm not sure if everyone was able to receive the links to the sites or the project page, but I will be able to provide that after this as well. So that way it's just like an easy go-to to be able just to get the data firsthand. So this is the Cove Marina. And right here we have uh, the aquarium and then the ferry point, it's not an exciting uh, installation or equipment. It's just, we have it hanging off of a dock, um, but this is right up near the Maritime Rowing Club right here. So we, in addition to the water quality data, we're also collecting velocity and estuary surface water elevation data. It's basically stage data, but since we're moving out into brackish waters, uh, we have to use different verbiage. And so we're calling it estuary surface water elevation. And the Cove Marina and the Maritime Aquarium have velocity uplookers that are collecting continuous velocity data in six minute intervals as well. And then in addition, the Maritime Aquarium does have a pressure sensor that is collecting estuary water surface elevation. And um, velocity was a big topic when talking about the models and with embayments, they're so complex. So having that additional parameter is really going to help the modelers when looking at the data and applying it, being able to determine the different tidal cycles and help us look at how the parameters are affected during the various tidal cycles as well. So that was just kind of an introduction of all of the data collection that we're doing. And of course, I do want to show some data uh, because that's always the exciting part. The Data is being reviewed right now. Uh, we hope to have the continuous data approved um, by probably next month, reviewing the discrete data as well. And, you know, the, the ferry point location, the most upper location, that really was the most interesting as far as the data collection efforts. When we were going out there collecting that data, you know, the dissolved oxygen levels really stood out to me the most uh, in June. Uh, during like the low flows, we saw really high dissolved oxygen levels associated with high chlorophyll values. But then also this year, it was a really wet summer, uh, July especially. And so, um, you know, we were able to really look at the impacts of storm events as well and how it's going to affect the parameters and the continuous data. But right here is just a quick look at the, it's a preliminary look I'm doing at the data. And I really wanted to kind of look at the dissolved oxygen and I plotted it against the phosphorus data as well as the chlorophyll data. And I typically saw the, the trend that I, that I usually see with dissolved oxygen and phosphorus where with higher values of DO, we do see lower phosphorus um, as the phosphorus increases in the water with higher values of phosphorus. That's where we usually associate the low DO values. But I saw this, this outlier right here, and this was very high. Uh, we, I saw dis dissolved oxygen values um, as low as one milligram per liter, 14% uh, at Ferry Point, and as high as 21 milligrams per liter uh, 254% dissolved oxygen. And that was a matter of um, a month. And August was the lowest and September was the highest. So this was the highest dissolved oxygen value that we obtained during our discrete sampling. And I was able to pull in our chlorophyll, our discrete chlorophyll data. And this was the same sample collection. And able to associate a bloom with, with an event that um, when we were out there sampling, which was very interesting. And so we're going to really be looking at uh, the different parameters, dissolved oxygen especially, that was the one that stood out the most, and the impacts um, that the parameters have on each other. So I just wanted to kind of show this first initial look at the data that I'm looking at and really kind of see annually, how it's going to change seasonally, the tidal cycles, um, also the, the events that are being caused from the rain and any other events that could happen, storm events too. With the vertical profiling that we're doing, uh, we're able to really capture the stratification that we see as well. 
in the upper Norwalk embayment. And so right here, I have the dissolved oxygen and it's from Fairy Point green to the aquarium blue and then Cove Marina is the darker green. And then I have salinity plotted as well on the right because we do see that surface are that freshwater layer within the first foot, foot and a half of Fairy Point in the aquarium sometimes too, which was really interesting. And so this vertical profile was taken in July and we could see that at Fairy Point in the aquarium, as we went down um, in depth at about three feet and then onward, we did see this, this DO sag and the dissolved oxygen just dropped um, from about 6.5 all the way to less than two milligrams per liter. That was at Ferry Point, which uh, in July is when we also started seeing the fish kills too on, on the Norwalk River, um, mainly between Ferry Point and the aquarium, maybe a little bit south in the aquarium as well. But those were starting to become more and more obvious too. The aquarium also shows the stratification. We don't see as much of low dissolved oxygen values in the aquarium, but you can see that they do drop uh, and, and we see a similar relation. The Cove Marina, we're moving out more into the salt water, not much stratification at that site. It's pretty much the same all the way down. And then over here with the salinity, we were able to really identify that fresh water uh, within the first foot, foot and a half. And that was the sample that we wanted to capture. We wanted to collect that top sample. Uh, that, that freshwater sample and be able to compare it to the bottom and see the difference. And then just looking at the continuous data, we were really seeing uh, you know, high dissolved oxygen values at low tide, also during the day uh, when productivity is, oh yes, hi Chris, you have your hand up. Um, do those yeah. DO values mean daily values? I mean, you just started talking about tide cycles, so I, I just was curious if that was a, a mean of the daily. Or I'm sorry, what was that? What was the beginning? The, the DO numbers on the last slide, were those um, mean daily values or were those just a, at a specific time of day or tide This cycle? was a specific time of day. So this was a vertical profile that was co being collected in conjunction with a discrete water quality sample. So it, this is just um, the depth as we go down in the water column. Okay. So the continuous data also was able, we were able to capture uh, some chlorophyll blooms with the continuous data as well. And right here in June, I have the top monitor and the bottom monitor at the aquarium. And I have graphed uh, the turbidity in red, the chlorophyll in green, and the dissolved oxygen in blue. And we were able to associate the chlorophyll spikes with the with with high dissolved oxygen levels. I like to bring in turbidity too, just because I want to make sure that the turbidity is not causing uh, higher chlorophyll readings as well. So I like to just kind of make sure that we don't really see high turbidity values that could be interfering with the chlorophyll sensor. So we were able to capture these chlorophyll spikes along with the dissolved oxygen more significant in the top monitor. The bottom monitor, um, we, we, all, we never see as much activity uh, in the bottom of the water column, but it's still always good to compare. Uh, we can kind of see some of the chlorophyll and the dissolved oxygen spiking up, not as significant as the top monitor. But what was interesting is to see what happened after we got all that rain in July. And so what I did was I was looking at the discharge data at our Norwalk River at South Wilton. And I was able to really be able to identify where the chlorophyll data became suppressed. And so I followed the rain event. I was able to see the turbidity rise uh, in addition to the rise in discharge, which is what we usually see. And then once the turbidity 
increased with the increase in discharge um, at our freshwater stream that that's more upstream that's where we saw the chlorophyll data become a little more suppressed the dissolved oxygen we weren't seeing those diel swings that we usually see with do throughout the day it kind of um starts to, we see smaller ranges of DO. And so we were really evaluating the chlorophyll data before we saw all the rain and also what the effects of the rain is gonna do on the Norwalk River from this past summer too. So that's kind of what I'm going to be continuing to look at with the continuous data. And so I just wanted to show the Preliminary uh, data exploratory part that I'm at right now, these are the Norwalk is always the most interesting data to me for sure. Way more interesting than the Mystic. It has, I feel like it has like more of a story to tell. And this is just a matter of a few months of collecting data and being able to review it. So I'm really looking forward to collecting year round and then for another year at the Norwalk and really see what we can capture. And our goal is, we're hoping that the continuous data will allow us to examine the magnitude, um, duration, and extent of hypoxia that we're seeing in the Norwalk River. This additional information will look at how the systems respond to changes from storms um, or other events that we're seeing with high discharge events. And then the discrete data we're hoping that we can, it can provide information on the cycling of the nutrients that drive the primary production in the system, as well as how the chlorophyll A and the algae respond throughout the embayment, throughout the seasons and the tidal cycles and the days. And so we're hoping that this data will be used to develop a dynamic water quality model that can be used to predict what changes may occur from any watershed management activities and impacts that are going on in the Norwalk River. And then this next slide is just some useful links that uh, I have that this is more of the national stream quality assessment that has been going on in, in the Norwalk River. And then this link right here is the project page that I've been working on for the the study that we're doing. And this is gonna talk about the Mystic River and the Norwalk River. And so it just provides a little bit of an overview of the study, um, the study areas as well. And then uh, if you click on these links from the project page, it will be able to bring you to our NWIS page that is pretty interactive and allows you to look at that data real time as well. So hopefully, uh, we're hoping that the public and can find this tool really useful uh, for being able to view the data real time. Brittany, and, a quick yep. question here. Um, with the chlorophyll A and turbidity, have you seen any anything that you could draw a conclusion about with turbidity increasing or decreasing with chlorophyll A? I definitely would like to take more time looking at the continuous data for sure to be able to come up with a more solid uh, conclusion or just to better understand how turbidity and chlorophyll work together. Right. I do notice that you know, when we see the algae blooms, uh, it from my first look, uh, I did identify lower turbidity values. And then when the turbidity increased, when we got a rain event that kind of came and we got some fresh water that uh, came through, that was when I saw a decrease in the chlorophyll values as well. So I'm not seeing as much of a it's more of like an inverse relation that I saw first look, okay. uh, which, which helps me evaluate it a little bit. One, one of the concerns we have with um, the Walkbridge project is under certain conditions, they will be doing some dredging as well as some tearing up of old equipment and old um, foundations. And whether they'll be able to contain the sediments adequately. And this, this is why we have a concern with about the turbidity readings. And this is where you having this data 
really is is nice. But what the uh, DOT did not do is they did not record the bottom turbidity. And if, if you're stirring anything up, the sediments tend to go down to the bottom and not up to the top, although there can be some, some that float, but most of them will separate on the bottom and, and disperse themselves based on weight and, and their um, density. And it, it's gonna be interesting because um, one of the things we'll be talking about later on is DOT does not want to do data anymore. And for the group, I had asked Brittany if G, uh, USGS can be um, used to collect data for other agencies. And were you able to get an answer on that? Yes, I was able to confirm that. Yes, we can. We can provide Super. that service. Jeff? You're muted. I'm so, sorry for arriving late, uh, but I, I think we should talk about, you know, the, the public hearing process and not, you know, if, if it's the applicant's responsibility to, to do something and that's the, that's the, the way it should be. I, I think we have to be careful about doing the applicant's job for them as a way of the applicant not doing what, what they should be doing. And I'm thinking in terms of, of water quality. So I, 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 don't, I don't wanna pass off the responsibility that DOT has to say, we'll do it for them or somebody else will do it for them. Do that, was, that was not the plan here. All right. The, the plan is to make a recommendation to do it right and guide them to the possibility of using USGS as the, per, as the people doing their um, they're monitoring. Well, I think we should think about that as, as whether that's the recommendation we, we, we all agree on to do. I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's an idea to discuss, but uh, right. the, the, the history of, of these infrastructure projects and coastal waterways and is, is that the applicant and, and DOT, for example, with the Housatonic project and, and the, the I-95 bridge, they, they, were, they were responsible as a condition of their, of their permit to, to monitor the, the conditions on a, on a 24 hour basis. And, and they, there was a threshold. Well, well we, we know all this, Joe. I, I think, right. sorry to interrupt, and, I just don't think we wanna propose doing their job for them. No, but we should be aware of options that are available. And, and think through it and, and for the recommendations we make uh, right. in the public hearing process, right? Absolutely. Sorry to interrupt, Brittany. No, that is perfectly fine. That I actually that concluded my presentation. So I am more than happy to answer any other questions that the group may have. Excellent. Any other questions from anybody? So we're good. Sorry again for being late. Is your presentation, uh, Brittany, available for us to? For those of us who came late tonight, or, or... I, yes, I can. I can absolutely make it available. Uh, would it be best if I sent it to Joe? I think yes. I just might have um, your contact, and and then Joe can disperse okay. it. Thank well, you. the other the other nice thing, Brittany, is this was recorded. Oh, great. Okay. So, um, Jeff, you can go to the um, to the meeting and uh, to the Zoom meeting, and you'll have the. The recording of the meeting. Right. So are we good? Uh, I hey. have a quick, I have a quick question for for Go Brittany. For Hi, Brittany. This was Hello. very interesting, and there's a lot of potential here. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I looked at, for instance, the January third and fourth turbidity uh, on the live feed, and I think that's when it rained. So it's it's quite interesting how sensitive this is. Um, but you had mentioned that you also, in certain of these stations, um, sample for pesticides and herbicides. And I wanted to know where we could see that, that data. And it would be interesting to correlate it with rainfall. And then we could see what, you know, uh, especially upriver uh, coming from Wilton. Um, I didn't know uh, how much information you have on that data, those, that analysis. Um, and Absolutely. 
Yeah. Yes, I, I, I can follow up with that. That would be our um, upstream site that we collect this data. And the one thing that's great with uh, you know, USGS is all of our data is available to the public. We we're more than happy to share it, whether it's provisional or you know approved. We we put our stamp on it, but I can uh, I can get that information uh, to you guys on the pesticide and, and herbicide data. I, I'll follow up on that. That would be great. Thank you, mm -hmm. Louise. That would that would be very beneficial in the springtime, especially with all the work different organizations are doing on cutting down on chemical fertilizers and trying to get more uh, native plants growing along the, the banks and so forth. Riparian buffers, yeah, it would be yeah, great. And, to have that. and if this can show that uh, during major rain events that we're seeing a huge spike in, in especially the fertilizers and the herbicides, um, that might have an impact on the public. Yeah, I would hope so. Well, Brittany, that... thank, thank you for joining us. Absolutely, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. It was nice to meet everyone too. Thanks. Thank you, Thanks, take Brittany. care thank and you. happy new year. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, getting back to the meeting. There we go. Um, ab about what John was started the conversation about the, um, the permit. John, do you have any more information you want to toss out before I toss a few things out? No, not really. I, I need Jeff, though, to, I mean, you can throw some stuff out there for us, but Jeff can bring us more full circle of what the procedures are going forward after the uh, preliminary meeting that we had a couple of days ago. All right. Um, well, I, I don't know what you said before, John. So if I'm repeating what you said, just cut, cut me off. But we, we participated in what's called the, the uh, well, as everybody knows, a, a public hearing will be held on the, on the uh, draft permit for the Walk Bridge project. And the public hearing is to be held because two petitions were, were received by DEEP re requesting the, 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 the hearing. The first was by a, um, a group, and I believe it's fair to say are, are cons of, of residents and, and neighborhood groups in the, in the area of Manresa Island, or South Norwalk in, the, in that part that are concerned about the impacts of the use of Manresa Island on, on the quality of life in, in their neighborhoods. And then the um, Harbor Commission and the Shellfish Commission also submitted a, a petition. Uh, John Pinto is the spokesperson for the Harbor Commission and Shellfish Commission's uh, petition. Um, so when, when the, the, the public hearing process consists of, and I, I, Louise, you know this because I guess you went through the public hearing on the, on the dam proposal stream in the watershed, but um, there, there are a number of meetings and, and, um, and uh, milestones. And the first meeting was, was held on um, Wednesday, I guess, which was a status conference. <clears throat> and the status conference is to talk about the, uh, the, the schedule and, uh, and, and uh, also to allow the petitioners to briefly explain what, what their interests are. And, and in this process, the parties, um, and, and that, that has a legal connotation to, to the, to the um, proceedings are the DOT, which of course wants to receive the permit and DEEP, which is interest, has issued its notice of tentative determination to, to approve it. Um, the, 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 the petitioners are not parties. They don't have legal standing to appeal or to ask questions or to, call witnesses, um, but, but can comment just as, as members of, of the public can. Um, so the, the, the first meeting was, was the status conference and they, they set the schedule. There's going to be a pre-hearing information exchange, which is going to be on February 2nd. So as you can imagine, this is, this is going to move ahead quite rapidly. Um, there, will, there will be a pre-hearing and, and, and at that, at that information exchange, the, the parties will submit the information they think is pertinent for the hearing officer to make a, a decision. 
Then there will be a pre-hearing conference and they'll, they'll talk about the, the experts that, they, uh, that the parties intend to uh, testify at, at the hearing. There will be a site visit on February 10th at 10 a.m. But that's not for the purpose of the public to ask questions. It's, it's for the purpose of the hearing officer to, to um, become familiar with, with, with the site. And then the actual public comment hearing will be on February 23rd at 3 p.m. And they said that the speakers will have three minutes to uh, each to- And to, Jeff, uh, I just have to add the, the, the referee, the, the judge, the mediator, whatever, was specific about people can attend, but keep your attendance low. And it's not an opportunity to get some comments out there to, to make her aware of different concerns and things that we have. Absolutely none of that. It's just mm -hmm. for her to take a look, see, and have things pointed out to specific mm -hmm. areas that are gonna be affected. Yeah. And then, then, then there will be an evidentiary hearing where I guess the, the parties go through the, the comments they've received. That's scheduled for February 28th with a second date, as a, a backup date that, they, that would be March 2nd or a second date. And then the deadline for the written public comments is also February 28th. So people can speak on the, on the 23rd and then submit comments on, on, the, on the 28th. And when the petitioners, the spokesperson for the, for the uh, first petition, who, who we didn't know, didn't have anything to, to say at that time. Um, John Pinto, though, did, did talk briefly about why the Harbor Commission and the Shellfish Commission have submitted a, a petition. And it's not for the purpose of holding up the project or stopping the project, but to to try to protect the public interests that are protect, potentially affected by the project. And since this is the biggest infrastructure project in Norwalk since I-95 and, and the most impactful, it, it's, the, it's, the feeling of, it's the strong feeling of the Harbor Commission and the Shellfish Commission that the public interest is best served by having the most opportunity for public comment and review as possible pursuant to the law. And, that, and that's what the public hearing allows for. And, and he also um, summarized, we had six or seven uh, areas of concern, I think that's the right way, that we think need to be addressed in more detail in, in the, throughout the, through the hearing process, and that the conditions, the, the draft conditions in the permit that DEEP has established need to be significantly strengthened. And, and the, the areas of concern that we identified, and I can recall them, we, we, we also submitted a, a background or an introductory statement of, of the Harbor Commission and the Shellfish Commission's concerns uh, to the hearing officer. Um, and then we also made clear that, or told them that we'll, we'll also make that available to, to others who, who have a, an interest in this, other agencies. But, but the, the several concerns are, one, the, the water quality related matters be, because the draft con conditions now do, do not require the, the applicant to monitor water quality during the work. And they also don't attach a, a, a turbidity threshold not, not to be exceeded during the work or else they, they, have, they have to stop uh, that. Um, we're also concerned about the bulkhead being proposed at, at uh, 68 and 90 Water Street. Uh, we, were, we were told early on in the, in the process that that was not required for the actual bridge work, but it was, it, was a, um, uh, it was a project that would increase the values of those properties for, for future redevelopment. We also talked about the concern that we have with the vessel relocation plan and how the harbor master and the police department emphatically uh, stated that they would not support and, and the harbor master is the key here because he has the, the state authority to station all vessels, would not support continued operation of passenger, uh, uh, passenger operations in the area between the bridges dur during the, the construction work. We also felt that, that there needs to be, or should be requirements for 
uh, effective communication among the, the, the DOT, its contractor, and the police department and the harbor master throughout the project. Uh, that, that's something that, that we feel should be specified in, 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 the, in the terms and conditions of the permit. We, all, we also uh, uh, noticed that in the draft permit, it approves the, locate, the, the mooring uh, of construction barges and work barges in several locations in the, in the harbor, but doesn't mention that no vessels can be moored in the harbor without a permit from the harbor master. So those also re require, require um, review by the harbor master. And there's probably, there's probably one or two other things that, that I, 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 I forgot to mention, but that, that's, the, that, that's the idea. And so our, again, the, the purpose is we think that the conditions can be strengthened to, to best protect the, the, the public interest having affected by a project that's expected to take five or, five or six years uh, to, to complete. And, and we said that we would provide recommendations for, for those, those strengthening of those conditions during the public hearing process. So the goal is to make the project, I don't wanna say better, but, but to, but to uh, pr protect the public interest. And we hope other groups would also, will also be uh, interested and, and learn about this and make comments during the public comment period that, that will, 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 again, serve to ad advance the public interest. So that's my long-winded discussion of a project. It, it, and very interestingly, we, we mentioned that it's seven years to the day today that we first got involved in this project when representatives of the Harbor Commission met with the DOT project team in Newington. So that was January 6th in 2015. And so I, I don't think anybody can say that the Harbor Commission and the Shellfish Commission haven't, haven't worked very hard to, to make this the best project that it, that it can be. Th thank you. And, and just to point something out, in the beginning, when all of this started at a public meeting, the DOT flatly told us that there would be no environmental mitigation. So we've gone from that point to hopefully guiding them further because they have agreed to environmental mitigation. One of the big steps was putting in the turbidity curtains. And, and initially, Jeff, if I remember correctly, there was no plan for that. And now there's plans for it. So with guidance from us, hopefully we can have a better job done. And, and the one thing, right, Joe, you're right. It's, we, we influence that in a positive way. Yes. Uh, there's still more work to do. The, the other comment that we also raised or area of concern does have to do with the use of Manresa Island. Um, not that we we're opposed to that, but we did ask several questions during the public meetings, I think it was last year, that, that haven't been addressed yet. So we would like to have some more discussion about the use of Manresa Island and what, what that means, especially with respect to the, the, the requirements for environmental remediation that, that exist on, on, the, on that property now. But, but any, anyway, so we, we look forward to, to participating in the process and to thinking through recommendations for, for uh, strengthened conditions in, in, the, in, the, in the permit. Recognizing that the permit is going to be issued and, and not, not that we're trying to oppose it. Any questions for Jeff? I have a quick one. Uh, thanks for the report, Jeff. It, uh, I've been through this grueling process of this type of hearing and um, I wanted to know, do you know if anyone is going to become a formal intervener? which gives you a, even a little more influence in the outcome. Um, and that would have had to have been petitioned already, I think. But do you know if the, either the Manresa folks or I didn't know if, um, if uh, the Harbor and Shellfish Commissions had thought about becoming an, a formal intervener, which is like one step up from a petitioner. I, I understand that. And that makes, yeah. makes the intervener a party as I understand it, uh, with, with, the, with the others, and also provides the opportunity to appeal a uh, 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 finding. Because the, he the hearing officer will make a recommendation with respect to the, to, to the approval or, or modification of, of the draft permit. 
to the DEEP commissioner. So a, a, a party or a intervener, as you said, could could appeal that. And I believe there's there's still time up 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 to a certain point where where the where someone could have. We had not thought of that. We don't have the resource sources or the expertise. I say we the Harbor Commission or the Shellfish Commission. Um, I don't know about the other group from, from Manresa Island, and we don't know if the city would is is planning to do that itself. Just but, but Jeff, wouldn't it. that be a role that the city would would and should and could undertake to look out for the interests that, as we point them out? That that's certainly that's certainly uh, uh, that that yes, in, in other towns that that's the the, the, the affected municipality. Would, would apply for the intervener status if if they if they felt that that was necessary to protect it, its interests. Um, but we, we we have not we have not taken any action. I say we the Harbor Commission or the Shellfish Commission it, it, them, themselves to do this. It's certain, okay. so, certainly something we could discuss with the city uh, to to see if they would be interested in 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 in, in doing that. I could talk with you guys because you know I've been through it more than once, and I'm happy. I, it just gives you a little more oh, no. security. Yes. It, could, it does from so someone from water. I'd be happy to help uh, you. You know, see if it's worth it because it does require more time spent on it. And um, but, but but also we're we're not attorneys, so it, you know. It, no, I know that you need an attorney new, to help. It's a whole yeah. new thing. We, 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 it's it's over our heads right now to do that unless someone chose to. To help the I would, commission. I would think that would be the role of the city, especially that this is a project that's going to affect many, 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 many people. I mean, people are up in arms and complaining about a line on Water Street to get into Vets Park to get the COVID tests. Can you imagine what's going to take place when this project gets underway? So, I mean, this, this the city should be looking out for our recommendations as far as being interest because it, it could affect ultimately the whole shellfish industry and our waterways. Mm -hmm. And part of it was the safety issues because there's nothing in that application that requires them to, to work with the Harbor Master and or other, other issues regarding safety. Well, yeah, this, the city would just have to, the city would just, sorry, the city would just have to hire a special, there are specialty attor environmental attorneys that do this, these kinds of applications all the time. So I'd highly recommend that be discussed. Thanks. I just don't understand what, why did water, why is water quality monitoring not in the permit application? I just, I thought it, all the discussion- It was negotiated to be in there, Louise. It so was what, negotiated over over a couple of years with a lot of input. So was there an explanation as to why that was taken out, or no? No, we we don't. We have not asked questions. I mean, the 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 um, hearing officer said, in, in so far that we're we're not interveners at this time, that we can ask questions of of DOT and DEEP, as uh, and 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 the. DEP representative confirmed that to me today that we can continue to discuss this with them. But we 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 received notice that the notice of the of the, the the notice of tentative determination to approve the permit was issued on November fifteenth, and so it didn't give us much time to really you know we, we, over the holidays and the comments were due on Christmas Day actually, so we we did the best we could to. To, assemble, to get enough signatures on the petition. And we can certainly, and we also said we would likely provide more uh, be, be, before the hearing. But, but no, we, we didn't ask specific questions. We're, we're responding to what was published. My, my understanding, and this may be not, you know, not correct, but the, the, that may be that they believe that the, that the turbidity curtains have proven to be effective in, in other locations. But I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing at that. And, and therefore, it's not necessary to do the monitoring. But but we don't know, Louise. We, that that's something that we need to, to 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 understand better. So do you have a dialogue with DOT and DEP right now, where you can yeah. ask questions? Uh, yes, and I, I I I asked the, the the DEP person today if we we could we could ask questions of him, and he responded yes. But I I, I was not not able to 
to communicate other than that today with, with him. Because maybe there's a chance to get that back, get some of these things, you know, just negotiated back in without having to do intervener and all that like process. I mean, it, do you feel that there's a chance for that kind of uh, well, negotiation? That's, well, that's why we're participating in this now. Yeah. If, if we yeah. didn't, we'd sort of give up and go away. But uh, that, that, that's our, 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 our anticipation. Mm -hmm. That, that okay, we would bring the, the, lo the logic and the, and the reasoning that we would bring. And we also have an ongoing study of the turbidity data that we're working on, that, that, that we're de developing recommendations from. That we're hey, hey, we're going to keep trying to do the best we can here. Um, but our, it's, it's not just that. There's also the safety uh, issues of the vessel relocation. There, there's the, the, the work at, in, in, on Water Street. There's mm -hmm. the need to have what I said before, Louise. Yeah, all those things. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for doing it. Well. Anything else for Jeff? Okay. Uh, I hope you got to read the minutes from the last meeting. Um, if you have it, do a quick purview. I, there was one change that I sent you. Did you get that, Joe? No, I did not. Oh, the number was wrong. It mentioned the grant that um, H2H slash NRWA grant, what, and the number was 15,000. It should be 50,000. Okay. Bill, did you catch that? I'm working on it right now. Okay. Any, any other change? Can I have a motion to approve with Louise's amendment? No, I move. Second. That, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, we have gone beyond our time, but that's that's okay because we're not rushing because uh, there's no shellfish meeting tonight. Um, I'll get a notice out for the next meeting and there's a chance that we may have to start the next meeting at 5.30. Um, and there's, there's a good reason for that. And I'll get an email out to each one of you explaining that. Um, but can I have a motion to adjourn? Uh, okay. Joe, you, you skipped the um, public participation. Thank you. Yep. I don't have my thing. Anybody from the public out there that wishes to add anything? Anybody who does wish to add anything can just click the little uh, raise hand button. If you're on the computer, it's right next to the uh, leave meeting button on the bottom. Anything? Uh, doesn't look like it. Excellent. So can I have a motion to adjourn then? You guys all want to stay here? <laughs> Thank you. So I motion to adjourn. Second. I second. I second. Happy New Year, everybody. All in favor? Happy New Aye. Year. Aye. Yep. <laughs> Time Take to care. rediscover those snow shovels. That's right. <laughs> Be safe, safe out there and stay healthy. All right. Good night, all. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.